Welcome back, pet parents. Did you know that there was a recent study done by Banfield Pet Hospital? Cringe, I know. But Banfield Pet Hospital, and they are estimating 75 million pets in the U.S. could be without veterinary care that they need by the year 2030. We're only a few years away from that. Additionally, Mars veterinary health researchers are predicting a 33% increase in pet health care spending over the next decade. So those two don't match up at all. And that is why I am so excited that I have today's guest for you because he is a uh, veterinarian and he is literally just out here on social media trying to give you free advice and information to help you and your pets. So, uh, Dr. Hunter Finn is here with us, and he is all over TikTok and Instagram. You may have seen him. If not, I will, of course, let him tell you where you can find him. And he literally is just out here trying to give you guys free information from a veterinarian's perspective. So Dr. Hunter Finn is a general practice veterinarian, and he owns the Pet Method Animal Hospital in McKinney, Texas. So if you are anywhere in or around McKinney, definitely go check him out. But he is providing primary care, urgent care, preventative care, acupuncture, (laughs) even does some virtual appointments, surgical procedures, dental cleanings. He does it all, and he does it right there in McKinney, Texas, as well as giving you incredible information as a pet parent uh, free online on TikTok and Instagram. So Dr. Finn, thank you so much for joining me. Uh, I really appreciate it and your time. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me and thanks for the great intro. You hyped me up more than I probably deserved, but I appreciate it. <laughs> That's my job. So, so <laughs> um, we are going to talk in just a little bit about these red flags that you you talk about on social media. And I before, before we get there, I wanted to just kind of get your opinion, talk to you a little bit about these vet shortages and vet tech shortages and like where your mind is around this, because I think... The average pet parent has absolutely no idea this is coming. Like they think that what happened during the pandemic was specific to the pandemic and that it's not going to continue to happen. And yet I think you're seeing, and I know I'm seeing, it's just getting worse and worse and worse. So what are you, what are you thinking about this? What are your, like, what are your thoughts? What are pet parents going to do? <laughs> Yeah, I I feel for pet parents. I mean, I I am one too. I've got five dogs and three cats and a horse. So like, I thankfully I'm a vet so I can take care of them. But uh, the the vet shortage and the vet tech shortage, veterinary professionals in general, it's a real concern. And I think the pandemic kind of like highlighted that, but it was already starting. It was already set in motion. And um, we're just not producing enough veterinarians to keep up with demand. Um, There's, there's just like, an unlimited supply of pets out there. Um, and a lot of that has to do with one, like shelters being, you know, just completely over, I mean, they're just over their limits. They're over capacity and people are trying to do the right thing by adopting these pets. But whenever they do have issues, they're having trouble getting into see vets, which is very, very scary. I mean, even just in my immediate area, um, I opened my hospital a year ago, a year last month. And I'm almost at my max as a solo doctor. That's in one year. And the other hospitals around me, most of them aren't even accepting new clients. They just, they can't take in any more patients. So it's very, very scary. It is very concerning. It is. And I mean, as a pet parent myself, I I know when I moved, I moved two years ago, so I had to find new veterinary care. I must have called, I don't know, at least 40 different practices and me being me, of course, I'm asking all the hard questions that people want to tell me no, because I don't want to over vaccinate my pets. And I want to do tighter testing. I want to, you know, do all of the preventative care without doing the excess care. And so I had a really hard time. And I feel very, very, very lucky to have found an integrative veterinarian who actually comes into my house, because I have so many animals. (laughs) She comes to me. Um, but I still have to go into the clinic for th- like dental cleanings and things like that. Yeah. Um, so it's tough. It is really, really tough. And for the average pet parent, I know I see it in my area all the time. People are like, I need to get into the vet, but 
uh, you know, my vet is booked out for, you know, a week or 10 days and the emergency vets are turning people away because they can't even handle everything that's coming in to them, uh, you know, over overnight and on the weekends. And it's really pretty crazy. So um, I know my, I'm really on the fence about this, but what are your thoughts on telemed for pets? Yeah. So, I mean, tele, telemedicine, I mean, it just kind of depends on how you define it. I mean, vets, I think daily or giving telemedicine when we're, ha- we're talking to clients on the phone, I mean, established clients, like I give my clients advice all the time. They're like, Hey, my dog, you know, let's just say like vomited one time. And a lot of times I'm like, okay, are they, are they still eating? Are they interested in food? Did they seem lethargic? Like, like what else is going on? Did they get into anything? And that kind of gives me an idea of like, okay, I think you could probably sit on this. And if it's getting worse, bring them in. Absolutely. Or if they're like, okay, my pet just ate like, you know, a pound of grapes some chocolate and some other things. I'm like, okay, let's go ahead and bring them in. Let's go ahead and get them in so we can get you fixed. The gray zone to me comes where we're trying to make telemedicine more on like the human side where we can do consults with people like patients who can talk and they can tell you like my arm hurts. I've got these shooting pain versus like dogs can't. And they rely on, on their pet parents to like kind of relay that stuff for them. I definitely think there's a space for it. I just, I don't know. I don't know when, I don't know how that's going to happen. You know, I, I, I would love to see it become more of a a mainstream thing. Like I'm actually not against it. It's just so many times, even for me, I could tell something, you know, based on someone description on the phone. And I'm like, okay, it sounds like, uh, you know, your dog's limping. It sounds like they're, they're just really uncomfortable. Maybe, maybe they strained a muscle and then they come in and we find out, oh, that's actually like a ligament tear. And and there's no way I would have found out unless I actually put my hands on the pet, Mm -hmm. but like, even that stuff is not super scary. It's more things like they're like, well, my pet's just sleeping a little bit more. And like, I mean, that doesn't sound super, super scary, but like I have seen things where people have told me that and they came in a couple of days later and their dog has a big belly full of fluid. That's like actually like a, like not to be too gro- gross, but like a, a bleeding mass. And that's like time is of the essence for stuff like that. So I would like to see telemedicine potentially happen one day. It's just, I don't know how. I don't know because the physical exam is super important and I, I've just, I've experienced that firsthand. Oh yeah. That's, that's why I'm on the fence too, because I'm like, how, how are you going to die, you know, attempt to diagnose anything if you can't put your hands on the animal and, and feel around and figure it out. I think um, for like existing patients, it could be easier, but certainly not like a pet you've never seen before. That would be incredibly difficult. Yeah. Um But also I think is like why it is so important for people like you to be putting information out on the internet to help pet parents just be more aware in general of what's going on with their pets. So like that person you were just talking about, oh, my my dog is sleeping a little bit more. Well, shouldn't they have also seen physically that, you know, the belly is, is getting bigger and like, that's, that's a thing you could have observed. (laughs) probably um yeah so like just being aware uh, yeah no a hundred percent and like some people are more like helicoptery and like there's not a bad thing they're just like my dog took three steps instead of four steps to get off the bed this morning that's okay it's like i don't mind helicopter parents because they care if their dog sneezes and they want to bring him in i'm all for that um i mean i actually had a membership program to where catered more towards like helicopter parents to where they would pay a one-time fee. They could come in as much as they wanted to. So they didn't always get like berated with exam fees. Right. It's like, cause I know those types of people benefit from that, but it is, it is good to be cautious with certain things and not be super like lackadaisical, but at the same time, like not everyone is that aware. Like maybe they, they work shift work and they don't see all these things all the time. Like, like, like seizures can sometimes happen like when they're not there and they never knew their pet was having these issues and they recovered before they got home. So like, it can be tough, but I have, I have had dogs come in with a belly full of blood and the owner is just like, they're just, they're not, they didn't jump in the truck this morning. I'm like, I get it. I see why. Let me, I'm going to use a little ultra ultrasound real quick and I'll show them like, this is why. And it's just not, not everyone 
pays as much attention as like some pet parents will. And that's kind of what it comes down to. So talk to me a little bit about, you know, pre preventive care. Cause I think especially as, you know, being a little more integrative, you are doing acupuncture and trying to, trying to expand your toolbox for your clientele, you know, preventive care, I think is so important. It can one, help keep us out of the vet's office, <laughs> which is generally where we don't want to be. We can do our like normal routine blood work every year, yada, yada, but we don't want to be there more than we have to. So for pet parents, like what are generally, what are you talking to your clientele about in, in so far as like being preventive, being proactive and what they're doing with their pets? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. So there, there's a lot of parts to preventive care. Um, and it is always nice if you can stay out of our office. Like generally, if you're not coming in, I expect that you're healthy and everything's going well and you're not just avoiding me. But uh, there are certain things that like can make a huge difference in your pet's life. And that's going to be things that also matter to us. So like exercise is super important. I think people think like, you know, for some reason, their pets don't need as much exercise as like like people do right? Like pets can become overweight, comes with their own slew of issues, but like not even for the physical aspects, but, but for the mental enrichment that you get from like taking your dog on a daily walk, letting them go on sniff walks, or if your dog has a certain play style and they love to play with a ball or a Frisbee, like they need that type of stimulation daily. And it doesn't just manifest in the physical health, but also their mental health. And we have tons of studies that show that dogs and cats have they have mental health and they have mental health needs and daily enrichment is part of that. And I always say physical exercise is a part of that. That's what, that's what my dogs lo like to do. Like, I'm not, I'm not like a runner. I'm not a jogger. I actually despise running. So my dogs, we don't really do that, but some dogs love that stuff. My dogs like to go more for like morning and evening sniff walks and they get to just e explore all these smells in the environment and their brain is just firing on all sorts of different pathways and it's really good for them it actually does burn calories too so it's kind of get you know dual benefits there but i mean from like a physical standpoint to nutrition is so 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 important and i'm sure you know as you've seen probably talking to different people like we're still learning about nutrition on the people side but even more so in the animal side like we're we're years behind in the veterinary side of things and nutrition is a super heated topic but nutrition is very very important for pets so you know, their daily experiences with exercise, nutrition, um, and just the environment that they're in. I mean, that's the honest truth. Like if a dog lives with, I mean, this is a drastic example, but if they live with a, you know, a, a chronic smoker who smokes inside, like there's a good chance that dog's going to have some, some repercussions or some issues from that. And they have no say in that. So the environment that they actually live in with other animals, with other people plays a huge role in their life. Yeah, no, believe me, we get into the nitty gritty of all of that on this podcast. We talk about nutrition constantly and like we will go way far into detail. Like we're not just talking about smokers. We're talking about the products you use to clean the house. We're talking about air fresheners. We're talking about EMF. We're talking about all kinds of stuff on here to keep keep away from your pets. Um just trying to give them the best, not just lifespan, but health span, because our, to me, our pets are so important to us. Like they give us so much. We, they, they deserve like the absolute best we can give them, I think, but that's me. Um, so yes, preventive care is so very important. And I want to talk to you um, about your red flags, but really quickly before we do that, can you, I, I'm going to put you on the spot. What is like your most viral video? What are you talking about? I'm trying to think. I mean, okay. I've, I've had a few viral videos over like the last three years. Uh, my first viral video was a video of me um, listing like five things that were toxic to pets. And that was my first ever experience going viral. The reason it went viral is not for the information. Although that was like a benefit, like, you know, that was there, but I was actually doing a terrible dance that was training on TikTok during that time. So I think people were like, what is like, what is happening? Like, who is this? Why is there like, like dog toxicities on the screen? And they just kept watching it. And I guess it fed the algorithm and like, it just 
that's that's what kind of worked at that time. Um, but a lot of different pet tech videos, I think people like to know things that um, maybe relate to them and their pets, like things that, that are okay for them to eat, like different fruits and vegetables that we eat that are okay for your pets. Um, you know, I had one really viral video. <laughs> it's kind of embarrassing, but it, it's actually happened. So it was a very quick thing, but um, basically we had a dog come in that was vomiting, wasn't feeling very good. And we ended up having to do what's called um, an exploratory surgery. So we basically went into the abdomen and because we suspected there was a mechanical obstruction. So like things couldn't move through the intestinal tract and dogs who eat things. I'm sure people have had that happen if you have like a Labrador, or some type of retriever. Um, but this dog was obstructed. And what we found was it was actually a, a pair of panties. And so like generally what I do is I show the owner like what that actually is that like we found, right? So they don't think I'm just like making something up. They just spent thousands of dollars on a surgery. So I want to make sure they know like, this is what we found. This is what we did. And this is why your pet should be better. And at that time I actually showed the, the, the woman owner and uh, the husband was not there. And she said, um, no, that's great, but those aren't mine. And I was like, <laughs> Okay. Maybe, maybe it's like her daughters or something like that. And I don't, I don't think they had kids or they had young kids, but that turned it in, that turned into a nightmare. And, um, I found out that that has actually happened to numerous vets across the country, which is kind of concerning. So that's like a whole nother issue in itself, but that video went viral for reasons I did not expect it to. Wow. <laughs> that wasn't pet tips. That was just my experience. So, yeah. So what were the, um, five toxic things. Do you I remember? One, I mean, I've done a different list. I know I put chocolate on there and I like yeah. to put like different levels of chocolate, but most people know that like if your dog eats chocolate, it's probably not great. Um, I know I put grapes on there. So a lot of people fight me on like grapes or raisins. Um, I think I put onions on there, but again, onions, like little bits are okay. People I think know that, but like if you eat a lot of onion or like you're like from the South, like me, we put a lot of like onion and garlic in there. It can actually cause issues for your pet. So I, I recommend if you're cooking up something like really spicy, like a Cajun dish, don't let your pet get into that. <laughs> um, I'm trying to think what else I might put alcohol in there. Yeah. Um, Cause I, okay. I used to see like trending videos of people letting their dogs like drink beer. And I was like, that's just, it's not good for them. Like it's not, it's not funny. Like I don't like that. So I think it was things I just saw on TikTok at the time that people were doing. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, I'm down with all of those. So, <laughs> um, great. Well, okay. So when uh, I got pitched for you to come on the podcast, uh, I was told that you have these red flags that we have to talk about. So I have been uh, patiently waiting this whole time to find out what these red flags are that we have to be talking about. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. Well, there's red flags for everything, but like it kind of comes back to our conversation about making people just, just more aware about their pets. Right. And something like if you, if you follow me, you'll see like probably every three to four months, I make similar posts in different formats about certain types of things. Like one, if your pet seems like they're just maybe like sleeping a little bit more, yeah, maybe they're sleeping a little bit more. Maybe, maybe they have something going on. Maybe they do have something like maybe they're painful. Maybe they do have inflammation somewhere. Maybe they have an upset stomach. Maybe they have pancreatitis. I mean, there can be so many things that can be attributed to like, okay, you, usually when I get out of the bed, my pet jumps up and they're ready to go. And then, oh, they're not doing that this morning. Like that should be a red flag to people. Um, a lot of times what I see, especially as dogs get like a little bit older, is that that could be a real a red flag of something common like osteoarthritis. I mean, I can't tell you how many dogs and cats come into me um, and they're just like, they're just, you know, they're going a little bit slower on their walks. They're not really keeping up pace like they normally would. And, you know, we do the normal things like we look in their paws, make sure there's nothing stuck in there check their gum color, make sure they don't, you know, that we don't see anything obvious there. We kind of put them through range of motion. And almost every time I find some sort of pain, whether it's like back pain, hip pain, knee pain, um, it almost always goes back to osteoarthritis, which you can't really diagnose that just on palpation alone, but it gives you an idea like, oh, this, this is the localized area. And then depending on if the owner would like to, x-rays can definitely help that. 
But if you're already seeing evidence of like osteoarthritis on x-rays, that's bad news. And that kind of goes back to like, I want owners to be really smart about preventing things like this from happening and not waiting until their dog's like really showing signs of not getting off the bed, not following them, slowing down on walks, sitting funny. Um, Cause that means they've been probably in pain for quite a while. They're just starting to show it now. Gotcha. So, um, yeah, there are always like red flag. I think that goes back to like being aware, like just paying attention and being aware of what, you know, your, your pet normally does in a day, how they normally feel, how they normally walk, what, you know, like how long they normally walk for those kind of things. And like any changes, you definitely want to pay attention, even if it's something that is going to blow over in 24 hours. Like, I don't know. I, I guess I'm just that person. I'm like, I want to, I, I need to be like a hawk on my dog. Like right. <laughs> I need to make sure this is okay. That this isn't escalating into something that we do need to go to the vet's office for that kind of thing. Um, and I would actually like quickly to kind of go back a little bit to um, preventive care. I am curious because I, I kind of have this idea of like, just in general, an average healthy dog or cat. For me, I want to see, you know, blood work done annually, a urinalysis done with the blood work. What, like, what are your recommendations for pet parents just in general coming into your clinic? Um, just to stay on top of things, just to be preventive, just to what, at what point do you want to start doing like senior panels? At what point do you want to start checking the thyroid levels? Like, where do you, where do you sit on those kinds of issues? Sure. I mean, that's a really good question too. And I mean, what I usually recommend for my clients is if you're, let's say you have a normal healthy dog and they're under seven, I typically, as long as they're doing okay, once a year exams with blood work and urinalysis, I'm comfortable with. Obviously, if they get sick, we may have to repeat blood work just to make sure like nothing has changed in that time. And then in my mind, I've always kind of done, for the most part, maybe not like a, like a Mastiff, but like your typical like small, medium, sometimes large breed dog. By the time they turn about six or seven, I technically, I consider them a senior. It just kind of depends. Every dog, every dog, I think ages a little bit differently. Again, it goes back to their lifestyle and what they're exposed to and their diet and all these different factors. But that's when I generally, unless suspected, I'll start adding on um, like a, like a to like a thyroid screening test, um, or if I suspect it. So there's some dogs who maybe I think they do have like a thyroid or an underactive thyroid. Um, if they're just really gaining weight for no reason and they're not really feeding more, they've kind of got like this dull coat or they're losing hair or they're showing some signs of that. I will test for that early sometimes, but generally in like a young, healthy dog between, you know, one to three years old, I'm not personally looking at thyroid unless I really see an issue for that. But Annual blood work is always good. If your pet's healthy, I mean, people get annual blood work too. It's to screen for things, but it's also to get a baseline. And that baseline becomes really important because every dog does sit a little bit differently. You know, there's some dogs who have a little bit higher liver enzymes than others, and they may sit there their whole lives. And it doesn't mean like they have a true liver issue, but they're just, that's where they sit normally. But if I did that, you know, say we never did blood work on this dog and they come in when they're you know six years old and they vomited once and their liver enzymes are a little bit higher, I'm going to think that this is a major issue. And you, you may end up spending more money on that diagnostic session than if I had all this history of multiple years of blood work and it's always sad about this level, if that makes sense. It may actually save you money in the long run than if you present to me or like an ER one day and you've never done anything and we're like, okay, we, we really need to you know, do x-rays, blood work, CT. I mean, you're spending a lot of money and you may not find anything with that. So that's kind of my take on it. Um, but preventive, preventive care does include, in my mind, annual blood work with a urinalysis. I think that's, I think that's your minimum database and it's super important. Mm -hmm. That actually just happened to me not that long ago. My dog is, she's going to be 11. Um, in about two months. And at least that's what I think. I don't know. Who knows? Yeah. <laughs> that's what I think. Um, and we adopted her at two and a half. So the only blood work I ever had on her was what they provided me from when she was spayed in Mexico 
a couple of months before we adopted her. So all the blood work is also in Spanish. <laughs> and they don't have the, the like, their panel isn't anywhere near as in-depth as ours, as our basic panel is. It's like a quarter of the information. And um, so that's all I had. And I, I finally, I was like, she's 10. I'm going to do like a full blood panel, senior blood panel, blah, blah, blah. And her liver enzymes were elevated. And I was like, I have no idea if that's normal or not. Because for almost eight years, we never had a problem. So we never did blood work. And yeah, I, I, I'm right there with you. I feel that I'm so hard. Yeah, I mean, and, and that's just my experience with people, you know, because sometimes people move and they change vets. And like, if we don't have all those records, which we always definitely try to get, um, like like a dog today, I'll give you an example. A dog came in and it was uh, it was just being a little bit lethargic. The owner, owner wanted to do blood work. I thought that was great. And the liver enzymes were all elevated. And she said, oh yeah, the liver enzymes have always historically been elevated. And I was like, okay, great. So I looked and like the last couple of years, they were actually higher than where they were now. Mm -hmm. So that actually made me feel a lot better that they were lower, even though this dog wasn't acting 100% normal than when, you know, the dog has historically had these elevated liver enzymes. We, we ended up, you know, doing a couple of tests just to make sure everything was okay. But that, that helped a lot. And it actually saved that owner a lot of money, but it also had us a plan moving forward for how we can monitor this. Because like some dogs, I think you said your dog's 11. Um, some liver enzymes like, like Alcos will go up with age and that can be very normal, but you just want to make sure it's not something abnormal. So having those, you know, six month every year panels, you can actually see, sometimes you can see it trending upwards and sometimes it's something you want to intervene about. And other times it's something that maybe you feel comfortable watching too. But like, even, you know, the blood work side is great, but it kind of goes back to like your telemed question, like a physical exam is very, very important. And it's even more important if you can stick with the same vet, because I know we see a lot of patients, but we make very similar notes that we will specifically remember. And like, you want a vet who knows your dog, because you may get a vet, you may get three different vets who come in, we put their hips through range of motion and two of them say, okay, they're just a little bit nervous or tight, like not a big deal. And the other one's like, this is not normal for this dog. I'm really worried that we might have like some, some early osteoarthritis, right? And you may have that conversation about like, are you on joint supplements? What's the nutrition like? Are you on fish oils? Like, are you exercising? What do you, what do, you do for that? You know, do you need to start um, potentially like inset therapy or something like a newer inset like Galaprant, which is actually really cool. I don't know if you've heard about Galaprant, but uh, it's a it's an inset, but it's a little bit safer on like the GI tract, the liver and the kidneys. So for like older dogs, I definitely choose to put them on that over like historically, we would usually use Remedil or Carprofen, but not to say those are bad, but there are newer options that are really, really cool for a dog who might need certain types of pain control, but you don't want to, you want to do the most possible job to minimize effect on like their kidneys or the GI tract or some of those side effects that we always worry about, right? You don't, you don't want to put your dog on a medication, but it improves their quality of life. It's definitely something to think about. Yeah, we definitely, and that actually brings up a really good point because, you know, we talk, I talk, I talk a lot in case nobody noticed. Um, I talk a lot about um, the, you know, risk and benefit of everything that you do with yourself and your pets and like having those conversations with your veterinarian that, okay, my dog may need this. What are the risks? So I can assess you know, what the potential benefit is versus what the potential risk is and like decide, do I want this medication or do I want to go another route? Yeah. And, and there's tons part. of, sorry, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, but there's tons of, there's tons of different modalities for therapy out there. So I, I consider myself an integrative vet. I think you said you have an integrative vet come to you. I mean, I do acupuncture. Um, I will offer laser therapy. I do like different modalities for controlling things. I kind of like, there are certain cases where they're super painful and I may need to use a medication like, like Galaprant to kind of reduce that inflammation in the short term. And then maybe we can do a mixture of, um, like acupuncture sessions, rehab, like underwater treadmill therapy and some laser therapy to really get them at a comfortable level. So we're not always having to consistently give you know, quote unquote medication. 
right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I appreciate that so much because there are so many different modalities out there and so many different things we, we can do. And it's so important, I think, because our dogs and our cats, they're individuals. So what might work really well for one may not work as well for another. And so we have so many different things we can pull from to find like what combination is going to work really well for every individual, um, which I think is is the way to go <laughs> in my professional, not professional opinion. <laughs> can I ask, so, so you have one dog in, in, in 11, you said? She's 11 and I have four cats. They're, um, two of them are 14, two of them are 15. So okay. they've been through a lot with me. Yeah. I mean, that's really good. I mean, cats, cats are funny. I've, I've always been, I don't say I'm a dog person because I love cats too. And I've got three of them, but, um, I've just, I've had dogs longer, I guess I'll say that, but they're, they're so different. And, um, I mean, cats too, like cats are really really good at hiding their sickness and their illness. And that's something I tell people about too. Like if your cat is showing you that they're sick, I can promise you they're probably very sick because that's concerning. Oh, absolutely. And I, all of my cat friends hate it when I say this. So I say it as often as I can. Dogs are so much easier than cats. I think so too. I do. Yes. Cats, cats are, they're all different. I mean, dogs are all different too, but like Let's be honest, like if your dog, you know, like if your dog hurts its paw, like out in the yard, it's it's probably going to let you know. Cats, I mean, I've seen cats walk in here with broken legs and like you wouldn't really know it until you, one, you felt it, but like an x-ray. And it's just crazy what, it's crazy the things that they'll hide and they'll just, they'll try to stay strong. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. And I mean, you know, that just comes from being both predator and prey. They are just like, they are not going to show you um, that that they do not want to be attacked. They don't want to, you know, be weak. They don't want to per be perceived as weak at all. So, well, um, so Dr. Finn, where can people start following you to get this information? Again, you put so much free information out there um, and we appreciate it. So where can people find you? Yeah. So all of my socials, I mostly am on TikTok and Instagram, but um, it's just Dr. Hunter Finn. Awesome. And if you are anywhere in the, you're, you, I mean, I'm just going to say this though, you are pretty slammed, but if you're in the McKinney, Texas area, you might want to consider finding out if he has an availability. It sounds like he may not. <laughs> <laughs> we, we are still seeing patients, but I think within the next like six months, I'm going to have to either find an associate or I don't want to turn people away. I never want to do that, but I need help to to give you the quality care that you want. You don't want, you don't want to go somewhere where they're like too busy that they don't remember your pet's name, what you've been there for that gets concerning. So like never sacrifice quality. Yes. And, oh, that it drives me as those places you go where like, you never know what doctor you're going to get. You never know what they're going to like. You just drop. Oh, I hate that you'd like drop your dog off and like come pick, come pick him up later and you have no idea who did what to your pet. That drives me absolutely bonkers. Um, please don't do that. <laughs> yeah. You don't I mean, do that. I mean, I, we, so like, I like, again, this is my preference, obviously, but like, I like pet owners to be present for everything if they can, right? Like some people don't like needles and I get that, but a lot of times the pet owner being there actually makes a difference versus like a drop off case where they're like, what is happening? Oh yeah, for sure. It and I mean, the, again, for me, like if I can comfort my animal animal in any way, like that is going to supersede whether I want to see what's happening or not. <laughs> I want to be yeah. there to comfort my animal. Um, so yeah, all right, guys, go follow Dr. Hunter Finn on TikTok and, and or Instagram, wherever you may be. And uh, thank you so much for being here. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode. Make sure that you're following the show so you never miss an episode. And please take a moment to rate the show on your podcast app. I'd also love it if you'd share this podcast with your friends and family so that they can benefit from the information to help their pets live long, happy lives too. Don't forget to take advantage of this special discount as a listener today and get access to over 100 online videos and my online dog training 
The Furry Family Coach. Just go to thefurryfamilycoach.com and use code PODCAST at checkout to get your first month for only $7. That's thefurryfamilycoach.com and use code PODCAST at checkout to get your first month for only $7. I can't wait to have you join and see you on the inside. Oh, oh, oh.